This is a case presentation on liver disease. I thought that I would start this slideshow by uh, telling you that in this rotation I got a chance to work with transplant patients and I just wanted to also put it out there that the first transplant was done in 1954 and it was a kidney. It was done in Boston, Massachusetts in the US. The objectives of this presentation are relate a real patient case to liver disease, learn various liver enzymes and how to interpret the values, review liver disease topics such as hemochromatosis, cholestatic jaundice, PBC, NASH, and primary sclerosing cholangitis in depth, learn the pathophysiology, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, abnormal lab values, incidence, and the treatment for each disease, review primary literature concerning PBC, incidence, and elevation in liver enzymes, learn the basics of bilirubin metabolism, learn how the pharmacists can make an intervention on a patient's medication-related problems, learn how to make evidence-based recommendation after reviewing the primary literature. Here's a patient overview. KD presented to the hospital on 9-21 with chief complaint of respiratory issues and pneumonia as well as intermittent problems with diarrhea. HPI is as follows. KD is a 65-year-old white male with a complex medical history. He has new onset of AFib since 10-18. His past medical history include bilateral lung transplant in 2007 and stage COPD with pulmonary fibrosis, elevated LFTs, metabolic syndrome, aspergillosis, and stage renal disease, anemia, BPH, mitral regurgitation, and anasarca. Anasarca is just a buildup of fluid. It could be in your tissues or it could be in your joints or any, in your cavities. Here is a current medication list that um, Katie's on. If you notice, the first two top two drugs are his immunosuppressants. Uh, he's on Prograf 0.5 mg PO daily and prednisone 20 mg PO QAM. Uh, recently, the PO has been changed for Prograf to sublingual due to toxicity. His heparin is on hold. His ciprofloxacin and clarithromycin has been discontinued. He is on metronidazole for C. diff prophylaxis. He was on Mulligan cyclovir for um, CMV. Voriconazole has also been DC'd. He's on Nystatin to prevent any fungal infection in his mouth. Rifeximine is for his um, hepatic encephalopathy. He has um, increased ammonia level at this time. Vancomycin is also on board for MRSA. Uh, Warfarin is on hold because his INR was really, really high and his liver is already uh, non-dysfunctional, I would say, uh, due to his elevated LFTs. Some other medications are just, um, let me uh, mention the most important antibiotics he's on is tobramycin. Tobramycin is also recently started due to his respiratory arrest and thinking that he might have um, nosocomial pneumonia so started on a broad spectrum uh, aminoglycoside as well as doripenem which is a carbapenem and along with rifeximin uh, electrolytes was also started and his ammonia level has been dropping down since then and I notice I have rifeximin written down twice um, Nyferix is for his um, anemia, because most transplant patients develop anemia. Renagel, also uh, electrolyte abnormalities such as uh, phosphorus is um, often high and Renagel binds to the phosphorus and helps decrease the levels. He's on Deltiazem. He was on Deltiazem, but now he's on Dijoxin. Uh, also, Procrit, Xyloprim, Halbutyl for his um, inhale, inhaler for his um, asthma and COPD. Nexium because he has end-stage renal disease. End-stage, I mean, sorry, GERD 
G E R D, gastroesophageal um, syndrome. He's also on gabapentin, most likely due to the fact he's a diabetic and for a guess, diabetic neuropathy. He's on fluticasone, lentis, lopidum to help him sleep, fluorester, oxycodone, and that's about it. His family history, his brother has colon cancer and he is negative for polyps or liver disease. Social history is his, he's a heavy, he's a former heavy drinker and a smoker. He drinks on and off heavily at times but not consistently. Um, physical, upon physical exam, on general, he's obese, alert and oriented, no acute distress, appears chronically ill, older than stated age. And vital signs were pretty much normal, afebrile and um, stable. He had pink conjunctiva, not icteric sclerae, moist mouth, although on his lungs there were scattered bronchi with coarse breath sounds in the area of the bronchus and the mid chest. Uh, in the heart, he had ob abnormal heart rhythm, um, it's called atrial fibrillation, and S1 and S2 were distant. Abdomen is soft, obese, non-tender, and moderate distension. <coughs> Negative for hepatosplenomegaly, prominent vasculature, but not true caput medusa. Caput medusa is kind of like right around uh, the navel, uh, there's this engorging veins, and it appears appears like um like a circular round motion extremities are uh, marked lower extremity uh, edema no gross stigmata of uh, chronic liver disease two to three plus edema skin is slightly jaundiced snack neurologic and lymphatics and musculoskeletal is not per pertinent here are his labs as you can notice i have some labs up here as well as some diagnostics and cultures from the past as well as some drug levels and his HBV is negative C. diff antigen the most recent one is negative his blood culture uh, was positive for Enterococcus faecalis as well as um, Aspergillus from uh, A25 was positive but the recent cultures are negative he also recently had liver biopsy and he had uh, abdominal ultrasound as well. Elevated liver enzymes. He currently has no risk factors for liver disease, inc including transfusions, needle sticks, family history, nor recent consumption of alcohol. His ultrasound was negative for biliary ductal dilation and he also does not complain of pain. The reason I put pain is that when patients complain of a lot of pain, it's usually hepatitis. And he also has n he doesn't have any needle stick history, so that also excludes hepatitis in this scenario. Um, and as we will look at um, later on, his AST and ALTs are not as elevated uh, as it would be in a hepatitis patient. So we can rule that out. We can also rule out the alcoholic one since he um, does not drink alcohol and mostly the GGT would be elevated as well. And then nothing suggests of stones or cholangitis per ultrasound. His possible diagnosis that I think that he might have are hemochromatosis, cholestatic jaundice, primary biliary cirrhosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, so his liver enzymes, liver enzymes are markers of inflammation or liver injury. Um, there, there are the um, normal values and some interesting facts are in over there uh, that males have more. And here's a trend for LFTs as you would notice that ALKFOS is has a highest trend in elevation in this patient compared to AST and ELT. So we'll go through each of these diagnoses.
important considerations for ruling out a diagnosis is to get a complete history. You need to ask patient about their recent travel history, possible parenteral exposure, and here we will discuss hemochromatosis in detail. It is a commonly inherited disorder of iron metabolism. Inappropriate increase in intestinal iron absorption results in deposition of excessive amounts of iron in parenchymal cells, leads to tissue damage and impaired organ function and eventually organ failure. It is most common in populations of northern European extraction in whom approximately 1 to 10, 1 in 10 persons are heterozygous carriers and 0.3 to 0.5% are homozygotes. There are two types of HFE mutations that we think uh, that Katie can have. The first one is C282Y. It is the most common form. Homozygous G2A mutation causes cysteine to tyrosine substitution at position 282. The other one is called 6, I mean H63A, 63D, causes substitution of histidine to aspartic acid at codon 63. So normally, hemochromatosis, normal body iron content is 3 to 4 grams. Usually iron absorption equals iron loss. Men need about 1 milligrams a day and women need slightly more due to other reasons such as uh, menstruation and they tend to lose more. Pathophysiology wise, mucosal absorption is greater than the body requirements. So there's more being stuck into the mucosa of your intestines and the body doesn't need as much so it keeps on accumulating. Progressive accumulation causes elevation in plasma iron, increased saturation of transparin, and elevation of ferritin level. Lack of surface expression of HFE, mutant HFE remains trapped intracellularly, reducing the iron up uptake by intestinal cells. Hemochromatosis clinical manifestations. Initial symptoms would be lethargy, arthralgia, change in skin color, loss of libido, features of diabetes mellitus, advanced disease, hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, skin pigmentation, and spider angioma. I have a picture of spider angioma over here, and cirrhosis of the liver, congestive heart failure, arthropathy, and ascites. To diagnose, you need to have some clinical manifestations, some of this history as well as this lab tests. So we already talked about the clinical manifestations. History-wise, alcohol ingestion, iron intake, and ingestion of large do doses of ascorbic acid. The reason ascorbic acid is, is that it helps promote absorption of uh, iron. Therefore, if you had a lot of ascorbic acid while taking iron, you possibly can have higher iron in your system. Lab tests commonly done are serum iron, transferrin, and ferritin. Ferritin measures your storage. Transferrin is actually the moving uh, iron through, throughout your body. Liver biopsy and MRI of the liver. They're a bit on the pricey side, but might have to get it done. Let's move on to the assessment for our patient. Katie's ferritin was 1595. Iron level was 98 and iron saturation was elevated. The serum iron level and percent saturation of transferrin are elevated early in the course, but their specificity is reduced by significant false positive and false negative rates. American Academy of Family Physician recommends against routine genetic screening for hereditary and hemochromatosis in the asymptomatic general population. So as far as the treatment goes, treatment before there is a permanent organ damage can actually reverse the iron toxicity and restore the life expectancy to normal. Removal of excess body iron and supportive treatment of damaged organ. This is how it's usually done. Iron removal is best accomplished by weekly or twice weekly phlebotomy of 500 mils. 
One 500 ml unit of blood contains 200 to 250 milligrams iron and up to 25 grams iron or more may have been removed during that time. Flood, the reason phlebotomy is liked is because it is safe, convenient and less expensive. Some other drugs that we can use are de deferoxamine, which is a subcutaneous infusion and it removes 10 to 20 milligrams iron per day. The next drug is not really um, used much and its role has not been established, but the five-year survival rate with the therapy increases from 33% to 89%. So that's pretty significant. Here's the trend for total bilirubin. Normal bilirubin should be about 1.0 to 1.5 and not so as high as it looks in this graph right here. It goes all the way up to 25. But the most recent readings that I have for Katie, it goes as far high as 30. So let's talk a little bit about production and metabolism of bilirubin. So production of red blood cell takes place in the bone marrow. Then it goes to spleen Red blood cells get eliminated into the spleen, then they get broken down into heme. Then that goes and turns into unconjugated bilirubin into the reticulo endothelial cells of the spleen. This is water insoluble. This molecule needs to be water soluble in order for it to be removed. So what happens is that albumin comes and binds and then it helps it take it to the liver where it unconjugated bilirubin can bind to glucuronic acid and then make it conjugated bilirubin which is now water soluble and direct therefore it's going to be easier for it to get eliminated 80 to 90 percent will go to the bile into the small intestines and large intestines where that's where it gets metabolized by colonic bacteria into colorless urobilinogen into sterobilinogen and sterobilin, which gives the final brown color to your stool. And then about 10% can get um, excreted into the urine. Therefore, um, if you will notice, the dipstick urinalysis can also pick up um, bilirubin levels, but it's not going to be quantitative. It's just going to tell you whether it's present or not. So let's move on to cholestatic jaundice. It's a general term for all cases of extrahepatic obstructive jaundice and microobstruction of intrahepatic biliary ductules. Elevated bilirubin and other liver tests can also can can mean that it is cholestatic jaundice. Ultrasound detects dilation of intra and extrahepatic biliary tree with high degree of sensitivity and specificity. And then when there is absence of biliary dilation, it means it's intrahepatic cholestasis. Intrahepatic is within the liver itself injury and extra means there is an obstruction outside of the liver. So in this case, it is not outside. False negatives are that if there is a partial obstruction of the common bile duct in patients with primary sclerosing cholangitis, some of the weakness is that it does not identify site or cause of obstruction. Some of additional tests we can use are CT, MRCP, or ERCP. ERCP is a gold standard for identifying um, a problem when you have a stones in the gallbladder, it's, it's written over here. Serological testing is also good for diagnosing intrahepatic cholestasis. Um, it's AMA and some hepatitis serologies are used and then if they are positive or negative we can go, go ahead and confirm it with a liver biopsy. So primary biliary cirrhosis is a chronic autoimmune disease which causes progressive destru destruction of interlobular bile ducts. Primary biliary cirrhosis is much more common in Newcastle than has previously been reported anywhere in the world and prevalence appears to be rising. Diagnosis criteria include 
AMA, which is 83% sensitive and 100% specific. It is darn good. Liver biopsy can be done if AMA is negative. Now let's go on to the pathology of PBC. Necrotizing inflammatory process of the portal tract. Spiles are infiltrated with lymphocytes and cause duct destruction. And it can actually have a wide arrays of fibrosis. It can be mild and then with progression, reduction in the number of bile ducts and proliferation of smaller bile ductules. Increased fibrosis can lead to cirrhosis. So what are some of the clinical features of PBC? Pruritus is like 50% of the patients will have that symptom. Upon physical exam, you will see hepatomegaly, ascites, edema. Some of the unique features to PBC are hyperpigmentation, xanthelsma, which is fat buildup under skin, and xanthomata, which is yellowish cholesterol, rich material underneath your tendons, and I have a picture over here. Lab findings would be elevated GGT, ALP, and mild AST, ALT elevation. Your IgM is also increased, hyperbilirubinemia and thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, and anemia is also present. Primary biliary cirrhosis is treat treated by UDCA, and this class is... Um, the drug is in the class of gastrointestinal, particularly bile acid agent. It actually works by helping to reduce the LFTs and clinical symptoms. It also decreases the cholesterol content of the bile. And then pharmacokinetics wise, it, it's administered orally. 90% of it is absorbed by small intestines and only small amount is excreted via the urine. The dose that is typically used is 13 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per day in 2 to 4 divided doses. Now let's move on to drug-induced liver disease. Overall, the reported incidence of drug-induced liver disease is around 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000 patients. One of the most common reasons for withdrawal of a drug from a market is an elevation of serum concentration of liver enzymes. And the, these are several patterns that I listed over here. First one is hepatocellular, and hepatocellular is broken down into four other, which is central lobular, steatohepatitis, phospholipidosis, and generalized hepatocellular necrosis. Then the second one is toxic necrosis, cholestatic injury, liver vascular disorders that are broken down into three, Cytotoxic agents used to treat cancer, some alkaloids, pyrolozidine, and sex hormones. Let's move through each one. Hepatocellular injury will have significant elevation in aminotransferases, as well as elevation in total bilirubin and alkafos. What drugs are responsible for that? A carbose, which is precose, is an alpha glucosidase inhibitor used for um, diabetic patients. Allopurinol, xylo, which is xyloprim, it is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor used in patients who have gout. Fluoxetine is a Prozac, is an SSRI. Losartan is um, Colzar, and it's an ARB. Um, and those are the drugs that will cause that injury. Central lobular necrosis is usually dose related secondary to Tylenol or aspirin. It can be idiosyncratic and be caused by a, an anesthetic agent known as halothane. And direct hepatotoxicity can also be caused by toxic metabolites of um, any, any of the drugs. And then you have steatohepatitis and phospholipidosis and generalized hepatocellular necrosis. Steatohepatitis is accumulation of fatty acids in the hepatocyte caused by the drugs and their metabolites by affecting fatty acid oxidation within the mitochondria of the hepatite, hepatocyte. The drugs that cause this injury are alcohol, tetracycline, if you consume more than 1.5 grams a day. And look at the mortality rate, it's 70 to 80%. That is dangerous. Welpruit, 
and then clinical presentation is that's how your patient's gonna come in as abdominal fullness pain as their chief complaint they will probably be nauseated vomiting uh, fatty stool pruritus and fatigue so phospholipidosis is just buildup of lipids and they build up into the lysozymes of the hepatocyte. The drugs that do that are amiodarone and stays in the liver for several months even after you stop that drug. So that's what it is. The next one is generalized hepatocellular necrosis when you do long term ad administration of isoniazid. And this thing called NAT2 genotype appears to play a role in determining patient's relative risk. There is a fast type genotype and there is a slow type genotype. In one study, patients with slow type NAT2 genotype had higher risk of developing this disorder versus patient who had the fast. Risk of this reaction is also influenced by age. Another drug that can cause fatal reaction in HIV patient, patients is ketoconazole. Toxic cirrhosis is caused by methotrexate and vitamin A toxicity. Cholestatic injury involves bile conicular system. Inability of the liver to remove bile causes accumulation of toxic bile and excretion of products. Elevation into alkphos more prominent than other liver enzymes and mild elevation of total bilirubin. The drugs that cause cholestatic injury are chlorpromazine, erythromycin, augmentin, carbamazepine, long-term estrogen therapy, vitamin E which is alpha tocopherol acetate and if administered um, total parenteral nutrition for greater than one week. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is just chronic cholestatic syndrome. It's just diffuse inflammation and fibrosis involves the entire biliary tree. So most of the pathology remains unclear, but we think it could be bacterial and viral toxin, genetic predisposition, and perhaps immunologic mechanisms. The clinical features are also similar to the PBS, fatigue, pruritus, steatorrhea, and deficiencies in um, fat-soluble vitamins. So the, some of the lab findings, there's going to be twofold increase in ALKFOS, elevated aminotransferase, decreased albumin, prolonged PT, PANCA positive in 65% of the patients with PSC. Ulcerative colitis will be present in greater than 50% of the patients. That's quite a bit. Let's see how it's diagnosed. Usually MRCP or ERCP. Treated with the same drug as I mentioned earlier, or sodial. And you can also do endoscopic dilation. Liver transplantation, unless they have a cancer of the liver, or I mean to say gallbladder. So our patient, if you notice from earlier, is that he also had end-stage liver disease. And I calculated his MELD score. MELD score is something, it's, it stands for Mayo End-Stage Liver Disease Score. It takes into account the patient's serum creatinine bilirubin, INR, etiology of the liver disease. The way to interpret it is that the score goes from 0 to any could be more than 40. So the higher the score, the higher the mortality. The classification systems are used to assess and define the severity of the cirrhosis. Predictor for patient survival and surgical outcome. And predictor of risk for vari variceal bleeding. This patient's MELD score was 36. Now there's another thing that the UNO's modified score. It takes into account the patient's dialysis and just takes serum creatinine at level 4. And I calculated it and it came out to be 33. And we know that Katie's on hemodialysis. 
Alright, what other issues does he have? He has bilateral lung transplant. So we have to keep in mind his risk of infection, his risk of toxicity, as well as rejection. When we give him immunosuppression, we are preventing him from having acute rejection or any other rejection. Now at the same time, we are increasing his chance of getting infection. Now when we give immunosuppressive drugs, we are increasing his risk of toxicity. So it's important to monitor signs and symptoms of toxicity, infection, and rejection. You have to balance, it's hard to balance and hard to find the balance. He also has atrial fibrillation. So I think some of the causes would be that he has history of mitral valve regurgitation. He also has sleep apnea, metabolic syndrome, and he's currently being treated with digoxin. His CHATS2 score was 2, he's at moderate risk, and to prevent his stroke, his INR goal is 2 to 3 and recommend warfarin, since his INR is been within normal limits. According to these two trials that I read, a firm and race trials, there is no significant difference in overall mortality between rate control versus rhythm control. So is the same in overall mortality. So whatever agents we have right now are fine. He also has metabolic syndrome. It is composed of hypertension, obesity, diabetes, hyperlipidemia. Also, just the fact that he has this can also increase his risk of NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. His other infectious disease issues, previous exposure to aspergillus, pneumonia, current infections include these causes are immunosuppressive medications, nosocomial pathogens, and another hematoma or infectious agent developing right now. Goal is to have negative blood culture and free of symptoms. If this person would shut up. So let's review the primary literature. I will discuss two articles. They are incidence and prevalence of primary biliary cirrhosis in the city of Newcastle, Tyne, England, and evaluation of abnormal liver enzyme results in asymptomatic patients. Let's go through the first one. The objective of this study was to describe incidence and prevalence of PBC in urban population between 1987 and 1994 using stringent inclusion criteria and well-defined study area and population. Their design is as follows, descriptive study based on case register compiled by retrospective and prospective case fixing exercise and examination of case notes. Population were all cases of PBCs identified by multiple case finding methods alive from January 1st, 1987 through December 31st, 1994. The endpoints were to determine incidence and prevalence by age and sex. Here are inclusion criteria. Anybody who had positive EMA, cold static liver function tests, or diagnostic liver histology were included, and anybody with formal histo histologic diagnosis were excluded. So the case finding methods, they included case reports from four GEs, autoantibodies, uh, records from immunology labs, liver pathology reports and case reports, admission case reports from four gastroenterologists and hospitals, as well as listings from Office of National Statistics of for All Death Within ICD-9 Code of 571.6. So the cases, there were 202 potential, included were 160, excluded were 42, definite cases were 99, and probable were 61. And here is a chart, incidence and prevalence of cases. The annual incidence rates varied between 14 to 32 million total population among definitive cases and 29 to 58 overall. 
was no clear trend from this chart. And here you can see the highest incidence of total cases between the ages 70 to 79 in the definitive population versus 60 to 69 in the um, 60 to 69 was in the total definite definitive oh, I think I'm confused okay so I said it wrong what I mean to say is that between ages 60 to 69 the highest um, prevalence incidence and prevalence was in the definitive group and between 70 and 79 in the total cases. Total cases equals definitive and probable case. So as far as the critique of this article, impact factor of International Journal, Journal of Epidemiology is 5.26, which is not as good as the other journals. Uh, if it's greater than 20, it's excellent, and 5 is understandable. Study addressed many problems encountered in previous studies of PVC. The strengths were that it had availability of lab data on EME titers. Inclusion criteria depended on true diagnosis method. Weaknesses were exclusion of patients without formal diagnosis, causes underestimation of true frequency and disease frequency upon. Let's go to the next article. Evaluation of abnormal liver enzyme results in asymptomatic patients. And here are the liver enzymes. Most common causes are listed here. Here are a couple of studies that came up with different causes. And I think it's very important. First study, if you notice, there were blood donors. And they noticed that it's, it was only 99 patients. But they noticed that four patients had hepatitis B, four had C, some had autoimmune, and only one cholelithiasis were in uh, one acute appendicitis. Appendicitis, what am I saying? So the next study, which by Katkov and colleagues, they also had 100 blood donors. They also found 48% of patients having alcohol and 22% fatty liver. So. And then the next one is Hulkrant's population was higher, 149, and they did liver biopsy. With liver biopsy, they found 56 patients had fatty liver. So the majority of patients had fatty liver in this case. And then the next study found had even higher number of patients, 1,124 patients, and they found, and this patients also underwent a liver biopsy, which is very good for diagnosing. And they found 41 patients had steatosis and steatohepatitis, fibrosis. So that's how it was broken down. So, causes of elevated aminotransferase level alcohol use. It's most common when your ASC and ALT ratio of um, 2 to 1. Increased ratio reflects low serum activity of ALT in patients with alcoholic liver disease. The low ALT is due to alcohol-related deficiency of pyridoxal 5-phosphate. Elevated GGT twice the normal level in patients with AST and ALT ratio of at least 2 to 1 means alcohol abuse. Some other causes, which is important to us, the pharmacists, medications, NSAIDs, antibiotics, anti-epileptic drugs, inhibitors of hydroxymethylglutaryl coenzyme A reductase, and anti-tuberculosis drugs. So here comes hepatitis. There is chronic hepatitis C and B. Let's go through C first. The highest risk is when you have parenteral exposure to virus through blood transfusion, IV drug users, cocaine use, tattoos, body piercings, highly sexual behavior. So initial way to test it, it is through serologic testing of hepatitis C antibody because it has 92 to 97% sensitivity. You can confirm that by RT-PCR, which is the gold standard. And then, if that is positive, you can also do um, liver biopsy to see what kind of damage 
has happened. Then we can talk about hepatitis B. The initial test is a serologic test for hepatitis B surface antigen, surface antibody, and core antibody. And if your surface and core antibody is present, that means you have immunity to Hep B. But if you have positive surface antigen and core antibody, that means you have infection. Hepatitis B DNA. B virus DNA test is needed to determine if there is viral replication and liver biopsy should and treatment should be considered. There is autoimmune hepatitis. Males have more tendency than female to diagnose. You look at elevated LFTs and negative for hepatitis panel. Most suggestive diagnosis is twice the normal level of polyclonal Ig. Screening test is serum protein electrophoresis and additional tests can be done. It's ANA, antibodies against smooth muscle and liver kidney microsomal antibodies and liver biopsy to confirm your diagnosis. Causes of elevated amino transferase levels, hepatic steatosis and NASH, mild elevation of LFTs in this case, less than four times the normal value. And AST to ALT can also be less than one to one. We can do ultrasonography or CT if chronic elevation of enzymes. NASH diagnosis is usually made by liver biopsy. Uh, steatosis is usually a benign course. NASH pro can progress to cirrhosis. The treatment is vitamin E and arsodial. And then we can also recommend weight loss for obese patients. Some other causes are hemochromatosis. We already talked about it. Um, let's go to Wilson's disease. It's a genetic disorder of biliary copper excretion. Its onset is at age 5 to 25, but diagnosis can be made up to 40 years. Initial screening, you will check their serum seroplasmin. Levels are usually reduced in 85% of the affected population. Opth ophthalmologist exam. They find Kaiser Fleischer rings. It's dark rings that encircle the iris of the eye. And here I have a picture. If we do a 24-hour urine collection, and if that is negative for seroloplasmin, we can go ahead and do a quantitative assessment of copper excretion. And when you think when you see greater than 100 micrograms of copper, that means it's a, it's Wilson's disease. Some other are alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is very uncommon. Then we have elevated aminotransferase levels. These are non-hepatic causes. Um, inborn error of metabolism, polio, polymyositis, if uh, strenuous exercise, things like that. Some other normal levels could be women in third trimester. It's usually normal for their ALP to be elevated. It was also, in also interesting to find out that um, patients with a blood type O or B, their ALP increases after fatty meal ingestion. Benign familial elevation because of intestinal elevation ALP. As far as um, age is concerned, ALP is higher in adolescents and gradual increase between ages 40 to 65. We can detect it through gel electrophoresis, but if it's not available, we can do uh, five nucleotides, nucleotides and, or GGT should be done. So the causes of ALP, bone disorders, elevated ALP, but normal five nucleotides, GGT, ALP elevation of liver origin over time. Initial tests are listed over here and to find obstruction and to remove stone. Causes of GGT are listed in this slide, found in hepatocyte and biliary hep epithelial cells, and then those are some of the causes. And as far as conclusions,
Patients are living longer after getting lung transplants, and long-term medical complications are increasing. Long-term survival rates for lung transplants have slightly improved. The five-year estimated survival rate is now 52%. After getting lung transplant, KD developed many complications. Renal dysfunction is the most common long-term complication. And of the incidences listed here, the one year versus the five year. Most common cause, I think, is a calcineurin inhibitor nephrotoxicity, and the treatment is hemodialysis at this time. Diabetes, I have the incidence written there. The causes is also CI, BMI greater than 30, older age, high dose steroids, and here are his list of goals of so fasting glucose and hemoglobin A1C. Continue his rapid acting insulin and long-acting uh, lanterns for basal coverage, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, venothromboembolism, neurologic complications. These complications can have significant impact on the quality of life of a lung transplant recipient and can impact mortality as well. Early recognition of these complications and therapy directed to prevent these complications may lead to reduce morbidity and mortality in patients who undergo liver transplant. So in conclusion, as far as the primary literature goes, PBC is common in Newcastle. You earlier you diagnose an earlier treatment you give, it will improve the chances of improve the prognosis of PBC. Here is conclusion for abnormal liver enzyme results. And this patient definitely has cholestatic jaundice, and all the other diagnoses uh, were not true, very close to being true, uh, but um, when the liver biopsy came back, it included severe intrahepatic intracranial or cholestasis and minimal nonspecific chronic por portal inflammation. And as far as this patient, I think that his ALT, LFTs definitely trended down once the offending agents were removed. We removed voriconazole, cardiazam, ciprofloxacin, and clarithromycin. It would have been good to see if we had removed one agent at a time to see the exact trend in LFTs. It would have also been, we would have been able to.